Hey everybody, and welcome to Pedal Powered Anthropology's Introduction to Anthropological Linguistics. This is the fifth introductory video from Pedal pa with Pedal Powered Anthropology. And the previous four were an introduction to anthropology, sort of as an umbrella field, and it broke down the four, subdis four primary subdisciplines and sort of briefly went over the types of questions that each discipline attempts to answer. And then, the next video was biological anthropology, the next, archaeology, and the next, cultural anthropology. And I posted them specifically in that order because to me, it's kind of a logical progression. You start with biological anthropology and the biological origins of the human lineage, the evolution of that lineage into something human-like, the development of human culture in that lineage, and in modern humans, biological anthropology looks at sort of genetic diversity and biological complexity. Next was archaeology, and archaeologists kind of straddle the cultural and the biological because archaeology is concerned with the biological and cultural remains of human societies. Cultural anthropology is even further removed from biological in that cultural anthropologists are studying the complexities of human culture and the ways they differ around the world. And they also attempt to sort of separate abstract cultural ideas that make humans unique from the biological adaptations that make humans unique. And now, this video is about anthropological linguistics. And one huge aspect of culture is language. It's arguably the, most, the single most important aspect of culture because we don't know of any other animals that have such a complex form of communication. I mean, I talk about my cats talking to me or my dog talking to me or my dogs or cats talking to one another, but it's not quite the same. With the use of language, particularly written language, you can communicate with somebody a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now. And that's a first-hand account. You're no longer relying on sort of independent discovery or imitation. You can have directions. And that's something that language really brought to the table that's not available to other animals, as far as we know. Now, yes, language is an aspect of culture, but it isn't only cultural. There are biological aspects to language. There are neurological centers in your brain responsible for storing or recalling or processing language. And once you access the language that's stored in the brain centers where it's stored, and you process it, your brain then has to send signals to different parts of your body in order to articulate it. And there are different aspects of your anatomy that are associated with articulating language, whether it's spoken language, whether it's signed language, or whether it's written language. And so, linguistics is an incredibly, incredibly complex and diverse and broad field. Anthropological linguistics is one aspect of that, and anthropological linguistics sort of straddles anthropology and linguistics. And because it's so complex, and because there's so much to it, I headed over to Rhode Island College, where I met with Dr. Gail Goodwin Gomez, the linguist in the anthropology department, and today she's going to help us sort of flesh out the different subdisciplines, the different things that linguistics studies, the different things that anthropological linguistics is interested in, and even the different ways that linguistics can enrich your everyday life. Linguistics is the scientific study of language, and it's very broad. The field is extremely broad because there are lots of different sub-disciplines within linguistics. Because linguistics includes the study of language at all levels. So you, you might start with the study of the sound system. Okay. You can be a, a phoneticist and study just phonetics. The production of the sounds, that would be articulatory phonetics, or uh, the, the frequency of the sounds, like acoustic phonetics, acoustical phenomena. You go from sounds to um, morphemes which make up words and then you go to the next level which would be uh, sentences which would be syntax 
So you have phoneticians, morpho uh, morphologists, and syntacticians. Those would be the three, you know, basic things. And then you you move up. Do you have historical linguistics, looking at uh, the relationships uh, among languages and how they've changed over time? Do you also have psycholinguistics. You're looking at how um, cognition affects language. So anthropological linguistics is one subdiscipline that deals with looking at language and its interaction with culture. And most frequently, when you work with anthropological linguistics, you work with indigenous cultures because that's where we see a lot of um, really strong reflections of culture and language. Although, if you're looking at anthropological linguistics, you also can see how those subsystems come to play when you're looking at an indigenous language because it's just like looking at any other language. I would describe myself as, as a descriptive linguist because I look at describing and documenting a couple of indigenous languages in the Yanomamin language family. So I pretty much fit into that old school of anthropological linguists who go into a village and then start documenting a language. Sounds kind of old-fashioned, but it's not really old-fashioned because language endangerment and the documentation of endangered languages is a very popular field right now. Language endangerment is a particular concern to anthropological linguists and linguists in general because language is such an important aspect of culture. Just in the introduction to this video, I kind of got into it a little bit. But the problem with language endangerment is that once a language is lost, there are sort of irretrievable aspects of a culture that are just gone. And what's particularly insidious about the decline of languages is that it's really slow to happen. And you don't notice until it's almost too late. And languages become endangered for a number of reasons. It could be a colonial impact, sort of an invading force is now in charge and a region sort of moves toward their language. Or it could just be in an area there are multiple languages spoken, one becomes the majority, becomes more popular. And in these instances, indigenous languages can kind of fall out of fashion almost. There's more focus placed on the majority language and speaking that and people can almost become ashamed of their native language. And the problem with that is, okay, I can become bilingual, no big deal. But when children are effectively raised with a foreign language and their sort of native language or what would be their native language is secondary, you lose some of the critical elements. There are aspects of languages that are almost like an inside joke where you could directly translate something, but there are cultural ties that you don't really get unless you're a native speaker or unless you're a member of that culture. And you can ask anybody that's bilingual, that's very much the case. So when you have somebody that's fluently bilingual, who has children raised with more or less a foreign language as their primary tongue, as their primary language, then those, ha those people have kids and they may have no connection to their native language whatsoever. So you don't even notice the impact of, of language endangerment until almost generations have passed. And because of this concern, it's given rise to what's called language revitalization, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's anthropologists and linguists and governments and community and cultural groups working to sort of slow or even halt the displacement or replacement of a language that's in decline. And one great example from history is everything we learned about ancient Egyptian culture once we translated hieroglyphics from the Rosetta Stone and were able to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphic language. Modern languages that are endangered already have kind of a leg up on dead languages because we have people who speak them. Oftentimes we have native speakers and obviously, with a native speaker, you can record them on video, you can record them on audio. So you record an individual, video or audio, and you can hear the different ways that they place emphasis on certain syllables or certain words in a sentence. And you can see the ways that they use body language to sort of enhance what it is they're saying. 
And you can't do that with a dead language. And another really cool gizmo that helps us to understand the different ways that sounds are articulated is called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram essentially takes recorded sound and represents it visually, similar to a waveform, but almost three-dimensionally, in that you can see the different ways that sounds are articulated in speech. You know, spectrograph is the machine, but the spectrograms you can look at language. A spectrograph is, um, is a machine that you take out, usually a recording of sound, and then it comes up with the frequencies on paper. It looks sort of like an EKG machine. I mean, mm -hmm. the result looks yeah. like an EKG, but it shows the frequencies of the sounds. And so you can see where vowels, vowels carry most of the sound in a word, for example. And you can see where the, continent, the consonants, you know, stop the, the sound if they're stop consonants, you know, or if they are like fricatives, then you'll see friction, you'll, you'll see the, 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 the different sound there. So you can actually look at a word and you could examine specific segments, sound yeah. segments of the word, which is fascinating. Well, I remember as an undergraduate, I did, you know, a very simple project where I looked at uh, words that had, a, I guess the final consonant would be either a voiced or a voiceless consonant. And what that does, it affects the preceding vowel. And if, it, if a word ends in a voiced consonant, the preceding vowel is longer. And you can actually measure that hmm. with the spectrograph. It's very That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. So that, I was really impressed. I mean, I was an undergraduate and that was just something really concrete that I could see, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of amazing, but it's still kind of far removed from your average person, as fascinating as it may be. But on a more direct level, you and I can discuss the ways in which language influences and shapes the ways that we think, and even constrains, to some extent, the ways people process the world around them. It's a pure warp. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really language and culture. It's the, the, the linguistic relativity hypothesis. Sapir was not as, what can I say, not as radical as Worf in, in claiming that language affected your worldview. But in fact, uh, and that was poo-pooed for many years, that whole idea. And, and in more recent thought, it's becoming much more acceptable that yes, uh, the structure of your language can in fact impact the way you see the world. There's a lot that we don't know about human cognition and about the human brain and language is right up there inside. So um, we, we do know that um, there are some very different worldviews, especially with indigenous people, the way they look at things. And uh, some of the indigenous, indigenous languages have structures that are very, very different from, um, from European languages. For example, in the Anamami languages that I work with, they have uh, only three numbers, one, two, and many. And it makes sense why they would have that because they also have nominal classifiers, which are little tiny words that come after nouns or are attached to nouns and put those nouns in a certain category. And so if you see that you don't need necessarily all of these numbers because you've classified these things in other, other ways, like whether it's a flat thing or it's a round thing, this is told you by the nominal classifiers. And if you look at their lives, they don't need to know more than one, two, or three. For example, in nature, because these people live in the Amazon, you have animals that occur by themselves, you have animals that are found in pairs, and you have animals that are in a large band. So if you're looking, you know, you know a jaguar, well, there's probably just one jaguar there because they usually are, are um, solitary. And oftentimes overhead, you will see macaws flying. Well, they're in a pair because macaws you usually find in pairs. But then wild pigs, the peccary, they're in herds, and they know that, but it doesn't matter to them whether, whether there are 13 or 17 peccary in that herd. It's just a whole bunch of them, and you better get out of their way, right? So it makes, you know, when you look at their environment and their culture and what they're dealing with, you see one, two, and many, that's fine for them. 
So yeah. their, their way of thinking about number and about things um, is more influenced by, as I mentioned, these nominal classifiers, which I think is fascinating, um, than by the number of the things. That's also really kind of incredible. It's, it's obvious to any bilingual speaker that the ways you process things and the ways you approach things are different based on which language that you're working with. But back when linguistic relativity was suggested, it was pretty much either going to be nonsense or groundbreaking. And really it's gone on to completely redefine the ways that we study language and think about language and think about the people who are speaking a given language. But again, we're not all going to be linguists. We're not all going to be linguistic anthropologists. And we're not all going to be anthropologists at all. We can't, we can't all be perfect. But there are sort of real life, real world scenarios and applications for an understanding of linguistics or at least a basic bilingual capability. One of the applications that I find among students uh, who take my, just my intro course is that it really helps them to understand language as a phenomenon and when they take a foreign language it gives them a different perspective in learning foreign language because, well, in the United States, many people are monolingual. So they think everything is the way that their language works. You know, everything works, every language works the way their language works. And so that's the problem with being monolingual. But if you have some exposure, which I do in my classes, to other languages of the world and how they work and figuring them out, it's like a puzzle. But if you have that opportunity, then I think it helps when you study a second language because you realize, hey, yeah, this is something different. This is, let's see if I can figure this out, how this language works as opposed to just assuming everything works like your native language. Some of the students that I have become interested, for example, when we talk about history and the role of language in history and how languages are related. So you see how different countries are related, how they're their linguistic background may influence their politics. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of mythology out there about language and a lot of errors about language. And this, there's a lot of um, confusion about bilinguals. But the facts are coming out now in research that show that bilinguals have greater metalinguistic awareness. They actually have more cognitive skills than monolingual speakers. People suggest that um, if you speak more than one language, then um, you know, you're going to be missing out on something. Something's wrong with a child that's learning more than one language. They're going to be confused. But in many cases, if a child is learning two languages at the same time and they mix words in a sentence, for example, it's because they don't have a parallel vocabulary yet. So they've only, they've only learned certain words in one language and not in the other one. But as they grow, um, they increase their vocabulary and eventually they will have a parallel vocabulary. So there you have it. You all now have a pretty solid basic foundation and understanding of linguistics and the kinds of questions that linguists attempt to answer and how that ties into anthropology. And this pretty much concludes the Introduction to Anthropology video series with Petal of Our Anthropology. And if, if, this, if you are now finishing your fifth introductory video, I have to thank you. It's, it's been kind of a long journey. You've watched a lot. Not all of it was good. Um, and you've definitely watched sort of the evolution of the Pedal Power Anthropology format, as well as my own growth as a speaker, as a writer, and, <laughs> and I think most importantly as a filmmaker. But now that we all have a solid background in, or at least reference point, for the four fields of anthropology and what it is that anthropologists are up to, I can now start addressing more specific topics in greater detail. So definitely click like, definitely click subscribe, and definitely keep an eye on Pedal Powered Anthropology's various social media feeds, because it's only going to get more awesome from here. Thanks for watching.